Welcome. So if you guys could all return to your seats, we're about to start our next panel. The People Could Fly, Myths, Legends, Folk Tales, and Songs. So to, the, so to uh, announce our next panel and introduce all of our panelists and moderator, I would like to introduce Dr. Pierre Morton. Dr. Morton serves as the Chief Diversity Officer and Adjunct Professor at Franklin Pierce University. So Dr. Morton, yeah, you can come up that way. Either way. <laughs> I would like to introduce Dr. Pierre Morton. So first of all, the food was good, thank you. Uh, <laughs> thank you for the food, <laughs> that was really delicious. I'm really uh, grateful, I'll try to speak into the, to the mic uh, so that folks um, uh, at, uh, online can, can hear me as well, but let me know if I'm too loud. So I wanna first of all say thank you to the Black Heritage Trail, thank you Black Heritage Trail, uh, and the Northeastern University for this honor of inviting me and others here today for this wonderful uh, occasion of learning, of celebration, of reflection, uh, and of dialogue, of history, and of culture. Uh, so thank you. Uh, I am Dr. Pierre Morton, Chief Diversity Officer at Franklin Pierce University, all the way in New Hampshire. And I am pleased uh, to moderate our uh, wonderful distinguished guests on, uh, that are going to be on the panel. Uh, I'll introduce you in just a moment because they have something for me to say about that, for, so hang in there, okay? All right. But I just wanted to uh, give a little sort of uh, context to what we're doing here uh, on this particular panel. Uh, the people could fly myths, legends, folk tales, and song. And honestly, this is about storytelling. This is the art of passing on our history the art of inducing spiritual and psychological healing to our bones. I mean, storytelling is the creative, the artistic, and yes, even the scholarly, means by which we pass on our history, our culture, and our meaning. History that is seldom taught in our classrooms, and what little history is taught in our classrooms is often watered down, it's often whitewashed, and it becomes a version that is not the truth by our lived experiences. It has no resemblance to us, to our people. This history, this history calls out to each of us because it's a tool that when used well, brings spiritual and psychological healing to not only our bones, but to our progeny's bones and to their spirits. It's also a form of healing Healing that James Weldon Johnson in his poetic sermons called out in when he wrote, Go Down Moses. How many of you all remember James Weldon Johnson? Raise your hand. Good. We do have some great, some Gen Xers and above here. Good. <laughs> and it is also realized in the collective realization of the historical plight of both black and brown people when Tupac Shakur said in his famous song, Who Do You Believe In? He said, and I'm gonna quote what he said in the song because I love it, Tupac said, can't close my eyes because all I see is terror. I hate the man in the mirror because his reflection makes things realer. We see this healing in the wounds that begin to heal with the healing salve of the celebration of the unstoppable resilience of our black and brown women in Maya Angelou's famous work, And Still I Rise. How many of y'all remember that one? Good. And finally, we take comfort in the fervent words of indigenous poetess Tanya Wilder, who reminds us that words have been used to erase us, but that words can also be used to recreate us. So today, as, as we listen to those who have put their hearts, who have put their souls, who have put their intellects into recreating us with their music and with their words, please be reminded that this is an honor for us today, even a privilege and a necessary salve for the healing of our achy, dry bones. 
So now I will introduce you. Here today is Dr. Akia de Barras Gomez. Did I do that right? Would you, Gomes, thank you. Uh, is, she is currently the senior curator of Maritime Social Histories at Mystic Seaport Museum. She is also the director of the Frank C. Munson Institute of American Justice. Why don't you come on up, audience, if you can give her an applause. Thank you. I'm so glad you're here. <laughs> and uh, we also have Mr. Cliff no Notez. Did I say that right, Cliff? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Mr. Cliff Notes, I'm not doing a very good job here, Jerry Ann, I apologize. Uh, Cliff is a multi-digital media artist, musician, entrepreneur, and filmmaker here from Boston, Massachusetts. Can we give a round of applause for Cliff? <laughs> and then finally, I, I believe joining us via Zoom, uh, oh, hi, via Zoom, uh, is Mency Martinez Riviera. Did I say that right? Okay, good. Uh, <laughs> Mincy is an anthropologist and folklorist whose research and teaching focuses on Latin American indigenous cult youth culture, indigenous popular culture, expressive cultural practices, and critical indigenous and anti-oppressive research methodologies. I want to say welcome panel. Thank you so much for coming. And we're going to, Doctor, you want to go ahead and begin and I'll hand you the microphone? Okay. So I will tell you while they are coming up to help me. I was given very explicit instructions on how to do this and immediately forgot, apparently. <laughs> um, so I am still struggling trying to figure out what to talk about um, because this is such a broad topic and it's such a personally and professionally important subject for me that um, I'm just gonna sort of wing it and decide as the slides pop up what I'm gonna cut out and what I'm gonna focus on. Um, I am looking at crossing waters, reclaiming ancestry and returning home. So the importance of our storytelling in defragmenting our communities and remembering where we came from. This particular picture, really important to me. Um, it, it was part of my son's senior portfolio in AP art, and when he brought it home, every other picture was of, my son's a musician, uh, jazz musicians, and um, there was one that dealt with uh, black oppression and so-called race riots, and I, I looked at this one and I said, oh, flying Africans, and my son said, what's that? And I explained it to him and he said, well, that's not what I was thinking when I made it. And I said, it doesn't matter. That story's in your DNA. And that's what your picture is. And so a lot of what I'm gonna talk about is just that. And thinking about where our stories have gone, even the elements of our stories that we've forgotten, it's still there, it's still in our DNA. And as a person of African descent, that is very comforting to me. As a scholar and researcher, it frustrates me to no end. Right? because I, I ultimately want to know where those stories came from. So I'm going to quote Toni Morrison here. Um, as an anthropologist, when I talk about myths, it's never, I never use the word myth to imply that a story is not true. I use the word myth to talk about social truths. Um, and as Toni Morrison said, and she refers to flying Africans in, in many of her works, uh, and I quote Song of Solomon a couple of times here, she says, the one thing you say about a myth is that there's some truth in there, no matter how bizarre they may seem. And this is particularly true when we're talking about the myth of the flying Africans. So I'm gonna very quickly share a story from my own childhood that pointed this out to me. Um, when I was younger, I'm from Newport, Rhode Island. My family's been there for a little over 100 years. My mother's family has been there for a little over 100 years, and they're from Cabo Verde. Um, we grew up in a neighborhood that was adjacent to a cemetery. And we would play in the cemetery, right? Cemeteries are for the living. And although no one ever told me, I have a distinct memory of playing in that cemetery and running in a zigzag when we, play, when we played in that cemetery. 
And so when my son was two, three years old, I'd take him to play in that cemetery, and I would have him chase me, and I would run in a zigzag too. 2017, I'm in Cabo Verde for the first time. I was the first one to return in my family in over 100 years. And one of the places that we stopped was a cemetery. And the person that was touring me said, you know when you're in a cemetery, you're supposed to walk in a zigzag. And I said, why? He said, because if a ghost, ooh, it scares me that the lights just blinked as I'm about to say this. <laughs> He said, if a ghost is chasing you, when you zig and zag, all the bones break and they have to put their self together again before they can continue chasing you. So even though I kept running, I, no one ever told me that. No one ever told me to run at a zigzag in a cemetery. I think what probably happened is I saw my older cousins and my aunts and uncles doing that and so I did it without knowing why I did it. But again, it's in the DNA, right? I continued to do it. So I lost the meaning behind that story or behind that practice, but I held on to it, and my son held on to it, and my son's children will probably hold on to it when he has them. Um, another thing I have up there, it's, it's sort of difficult to see, um, that is from uh, Benin, from Cotonou Benin, when I was there studying African spirituality and participated in Egungun, which is ancestral uh, ritual, ancestral dance. And you look at the movements, and you look at dance movements even to this day here in the US in black communities, and they're the same, right? And so I, I credit Dr. Anita Gonzalez for pointing that out to me because when she talks about rhythm and movement, she also says it's in our DNA. Very few of us are taught how to dance and taught how to move our bodies, and we do it anyway, right? That speaks to those ancestral movements. And so, uh, as, are people in the audience familiar with this, this cosmogram? So this is a Bakongo cosmogram, and I don't have a lot of time, so I'm gonna go through it really quickly. Essentially, it's the universe. This is how time and space works in the universe. So the, the horizontal line, that's the Kalunga, that is literally water. Um, if you look all the way to the right, that circle, think of that as the, the sun, the rising of the sun. The sun comes up, hits its high point at noon, and then it goes under the water. And we know it's still there, we know it exists, we know it's gonna rise again, but we can't see it. We can also think of this as the scope of human life and existence, right? We're born, we live, we die, we become ancestors. And even though you can't see your ancestors, they're there, they're active, right? So every death is a rebirth. Every birth is the death of what proceeded before it. Really important to think about in the context of our stories and the way our stories have creatively adapted to our circumstances here in the US. So it's very easy to see in the Caribbean, in the American South, how African spirituality has been maintained. The assumption has always been here in New England, it disappeared and we became Christian and we forgot those roots. But if you look at the center of that cosmogram, what is it? It's a cross. And it's a cross that indicates resurrection. So being told that a cross indicates resurrection is something that Africans would have been very attuned to. It was not new information, right? Um, the idea of water and rebirth was not, right, being baptized was not something that was new to Africans, right? So the, even though it's more difficult to find evidence for here in New England, I am constantly on the lookout for that creative adaptation. And rather than the simplistic view of Africanisms, right, what remained intact and whole that we can point to? How did we creatively adapt to our circumstances and maintain our identities and maintain, you know, if you think about something like Nkisi, in the Congo, you may have seen some of the sculptures with nails in them and maybe cowrie shells on them or hair, um, those were used in prayer. And what activates your prayers with Nkisi is hammering it with a nail, right? Hitting it with a nail. What is a more powerful Nkisi than being shown an image of Jesus nailed to a cross, right? And so again, I think about how these things 
were not new, and if you know anything of African spirituality, if you practice any type of African spirituality, you know it's inclusive. There's no rejection of new information because there's an understanding that we don't know everything and we are constantly needing to learn things. So if we think about the story of Ebo Landing, right, the myth of Ebo Landing, that mass suicide where Africans got off the slave ship, saw what was in store for them, and collectively decided to walk in the water and commit suicide. That's the historian's perspective on what happened in that story. But if you talk to Gullah Geechee folks, if you talk to African descendants, if you talk to Africans, what are they, if you're familiar with the story, what, what happened with the people at Ebo Landing? They flew home, right? But if you look, you can understand why that makes sense if you look at that cosmogram, mm -hmm. right? Death, the euphemism for death, for the Mende, for many West African peoples, the euphemism for death is literally crossing the waters. So they flew home. They went down below into the Kalunga and they flew back home. This is how our stories are maintained, right? And when I used to teach, if you look at that picture to the right, you know, when we talk about these stories continuing to be a part of our experience and us making sure those stories are passed down, you can look at films like Daughters of the Dust that tells the story. But when I was teaching, you know, way back in 2016, 2017, I would say even Beyonce included the story of Eba Landing in one of her videos, right? So it's still something that's really important in, the, in our storytelling. And if we want to look further at where our, war, our water stories went, how we've preserved them, we can look at things like Afrofuturism which if you read the novels, if you look at the artwork, if you listen to the music, a lot of it has to do with Mamiwata, right? And mermaids. And that might not be explicitly stated, but it's a key component of maintaining those stories of African spirituality in the underwater world of our ancestors. Probably tough to see, but even Jimi Hendrix lyrics, right? So he wrote a song called 1983, A Merman I Should Turn to Be. And he talks about leaving this world of trouble and strife and war and going into the water. He says, hurrah, I awake from yesterday, alive, but the war is here to stay. So my love, Katharina, and me decide to take our last walk through the noise to the sea, not to die, but to reborn, away from land so battered and torn forever, forever. That is resurrection, that is the Kalunga, that is rebirth, right? All of that is maintained in what, you know, surface level, most people think of as just a rock song. But if you listen to his lyrics, you get that sense of African spirituality being maintained. And then I throw this one out there. This is my, my end note. Um, there are a lot of things that I think, I, I think should be researched, but I know I don't have the time to do it. So I'm gonna throw this out there. Maybe someone will pick it up and, and research it and I'll be happy to read it one day. Um, we all know the story of you know, 50s, 60s, even before that, right? Blues musicians who went to the crossroads, sold their soul to the devil, and that's how they became famous, right? Are people familiar with that? Okay. Um, and, and, it's, and it's a story that originated in American blues and carried over into like 60s, 70s rock and roll music. And I've always had this sneaking suspicion that the story did not originate with the devil. If you look at African spirituality, there is no devil, right? There's no evil that's done in the world except for what people do. But there is a, a divinity, a spirit, uh, goes by lots of different names, Elagua, Papalegba um, in the Caribbean, he is the guardian of the crossroads. Um, you have to ask him permission before you go through any major changes in your life, and you have to pay respects when those changes turn out well. Um, his colors are red and black. If you see images of him, often he has horns. 
Um, if you see sculptures of him in the woods, in places like Benin, he has horns, and he's often depicted as having a very large penis. And because he is the guardian of the crossroads, doesn't it make sense that that is also the preservation of an African story? Selling your soul to the devil to ask to engage in this endeavor of becoming a musician or learn the skill of being a great guitar player, right? Is, in my mind, probably a story that derives from that divinity, Elagua, right? And so again, as, and, and where's the proof of that, right? I might never find the proof of that, but I believe that's the way we've maintained our stories. And again, as a person of African descent, as a person who has been embedded in African spirituality, um, that gives me great comfort that our stories are being maintained in that way. There's a small part of me, the archeologist and anthropologist, that wishes I could find some more evidence of it to say that it is so and scholars will, will take it as authoritative. So with that being said, and, and I apologize, right? This was supposed to be a scholarly presentation. This is mostly my thoughts and, and the questions I think we should be asking of our research and the questions we should be asking of our stories rather than assuming that they've disappeared um, because of processes of assimilation. And so I lied before, this is actually where I'm gonna end. So. <laughs> So um, I want to thank all of you, but I, this is an image of a cowrie shell. And this cowrie shell is actually the first thing that got me thinking along these lines. As I said earlier, I'm from Newport, Rhode Island. The oldest standing home in Newport, Rhode Island is the Wanton Lyman Hazard House. And this is a known site of slavery. Enslaved people lived in the attic spaces, um, and we know their names, Jenny, Kassan, Bristow, and Cardardo. In 2005, while some work was being done in the attic, um, a floorboard was pulled up and a kissy bundle was found under the floorboard. But the reason the Nkissi bundle is a clear example of creative adaptation in New England, you know, if you look at those Congolese and kissy, they are figures, they are sculptures that have cowrie shell and nails and hair and other things to, to invoke prayer. The enslaved people couldn't do that, but what they did was, within a bundle, they put all of the elements of an enkisi into a little burlap sack. Bones, shell, pins, nails. And lo and behold, there was a cowrie shell, which is so significant in terms of stories of Mamiwata, stories of feminine power stories of the divinity of Africans, stories of the creator. So even in Newport, Rhode Island, in the early 18th century, those stories were being maintained within a household where enslaved people were also instructed in Christianity and were documented as being Christianized. And so I'll leave you with that thought and hopefully as we're doing research on our stories and storytelling, uh, we continue to look for those, those clues about adaptive, uh, creative adaptations in the maintenance of our stories and let go of this notion that because they're not so blatant as in Santeria or Vudun or Ring Shouts in the South that our stories have disappeared. Thank you. Thank you so much. Wow. <laughs> and that is uh, healing to my bones uh, personally. Thank you so much. And so uh, Cliff, your turn, you wanna come on up? All right, everyone welcome Cliff, please. Yep. All right, so, hi, hello, how's, how's everyone doing? Good afternoon. Good afternoon. There we go. All right, so I'm still seeing slides from the previous presentation here. How can I change this on this computer so that Oh, it's on us now. We got OBS up there, okay. Okay, so hello everyone. My name is, well, they do that. Um, so my name is Cliff Notes. I'm born and raised here in Boston, Massachusetts. I'm also Dominican and Haitian, and that's gonna be a big part of my presentation here today. So I've been a musician and an artist and a filmmaker for the entirety of my life. And the earlier parts of my career, especially when I was in grad school, 
almost 10 years ago now, um, I was uh, very much like McKinley, focusing on a lot of the trauma uh, that was happening within the black community. Trayvon Martin had passed away, Tamir Rice had passed away. I had worked on this one piece of, I was working on several different pieces, uh, film pieces of taking the security footage uh, specifically for Tamir Rice um, of his shooting and then going and digitally removing Tamir Rice from that so that the security footage was entirely just you're watching the police officers interact with nothing. And I did a series of those. And those helped uh, my artistic career in a lot of different ways in opening up doors. But what I did not consider was the fact that I was spending so much time with this trauma and letting that build up inside of me. So eventually, what I figured out I needed to do was go to therapy, and so I got a therapist. Let's make some noise for therapy. Um, and uh, something interesting started, I, I, well, first of all, in going to therapy, you have to find uh, the right therapist, um, which is a whole problem within itself. Um, and I wanted, uh, unbeknownst to me, I did not realize how difficult this would be. I wanted a therapist that was a black man. Such a trivializing thing. Um, so after going through several different therapists, I finally found one therapist that I really started to connect with. Um, and what was interesting, and it completely went over my head over those first couple months of us talking together, was he was bringing up this, uh, some ideas from this religion that I had known about, but I did not fully understand, um, called voodoo. Um, and that's gonna be the topic of my conversation. Um, originally, it was called voodoo, or voodoo, voodoo, um, and surrealism in the black culture. But what I started to realize that surrealism is something that is kind of ingrained in us, and it's already an obvious thing. The things that we experience from the day to day are already surreal within themselves. So I wanted to rethink about it as reclaiming power. How many of y'all have heard about voodoo before? Most of y'all, oh, beautiful. Um, what do y'all know about voodoo? The things that you may have been told about it, just shout it out. Haitian. Haitian. Dark, power, rebirth. rebirth. Okay, so that's a new one. We're getting on to the more scholarly uh, part of things, and that's taken away from my uh, my presentation a little bit. Um, <laughs> we're gonna get to the rebirth part. Um, but what I what I started to notice about. Uh, uh, the representation of what voodoo was, especially within popular culture, was it, it wasn't all that empowering to feel like a Haitian or to be a Haitian and to see the representation that was uh, being presented of who I could be or should be. So here's a couple different movies. Um, the first one, oh, this is 2023. Uh, Bad Boys 2 came out in 2003. Um, anyone see that movie? There was like a very small clip within that. And first of all, I'm excited to go see Will Smith in theaters, uh, who was in this movie with Martin, uh, Martin Lawrence. Um, and there's like this one scene, super violent, they have to go get these bad guys, and then there are these Haitians, and they go into like this, uh, this like dilapidated mansion, and this one guy's like, the devil is not welcome here. And, <laughs> uh, and it was, it, this is 2003, so I'm 13 at the time, and I have to go to school. Um, and so every white kid in my, in my class was saying, the devil is not welcome here, over and over and over. Um, it wasn't the all-powerful experience that I wanted or needed uh, as a young Haitian trying to understand their power and what could be possible. Um, and then when I got to film school later on in life, I learned about this film called White Zombie, which came out in 1936. Um, and uh, actually, I can play a clip from this if this lets me go there. From Haiti, land of the voodoo, comes the most infamous cult of all, Bela Lugosi. Oh, you can't see this. Let me see if I could. Uh, let's see if I could do this real quick. As murder legendre. I see death. Master of the undead damned. Sinister power behind the white zombie. The white zombie, terrifying, terrifying stuff. Um, <laughs> 
Uh, but this was uh, very much the story of what was happening um, in culture, in the culture of uh, Hollywood, uh, going into black culture, seeing these things that we had never seen before, and then going in automatically villainizing them. So what I want, uh, I mean, in the last movie, I'm not gonna show you the trailer, it wasn't that great of a movie, it came out two years ago, Spell with Amari Hardwick, there's some, and then that's where we get kind of that idea of uh, the voodoo doll, um, and putting pins in it, and then somebody else, somewhere else, is like, ah, my heart. Um, it's, uh, these are all the kind of, first representations of what I've seen of voodoo. And then you also have things like uh, one of my favorite all-time albums, uh, D'Angelo's Voodoo, but it really has nothing to do with actual voodoo culture. Um, and then you can go deeper and, uh, and look at all these other different references, but the thing that started to strike my interest was why out of all of the things, out of all of the religions and things that we see in the media, is it this specific religion that uh, is not given as much love or attention or a representation. Um, well, first of all, uh, I go back to my first slide where uh, you have these different spellings. Um, and vo voodoo is what we know in popular culture, but if you actually go to West Africa or into Haiti, they will refer to it as voodoo or voodoon. Um, and that is the first step to start starting to understand why. Uh, so there was this thing that happened in 1804 called the Haitian Revolution. Um, and have y'all heard of the Haitian Revolution? For those of y'all who have heard of it, you understand the power of it. If you haven't, it's by design. So from 1791 to 1804, about 500,000 slaves, uh, which made up about 95% of the population of Haiti. There were about 40,000 white uh, people um, and then 30,000 free slaves. 500,000 of them uprose against uh, their white counterparts from France and overtook and led one of the, mo the first successful slave rebellions um, in African, in all of history. Um, what uh, most of us know Toussaint Louverture, whose face is covered up by Hispaniola for some reason, uh, was the first uh, former slave, came in, right, this institution of 1801. What was interesting is in, in Haitian culture or in Haitian language, uh, the word for people is neg. Um, and part of the Haitian constitution in 1801 was that all the different people that lived in Haiti, regardless of race or creed or religion, were all black people. So neg, obviously, a derivative of Negro, um, being something that is heavily ingrained within us. So when you have, when you have the first successful slave rebellion and images of decapitated white slave owners um, being painted and celebrated throughout a culture, what do you think the rest of the world starts to think? Yeah, uh, that's, 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 pretty, that's a pretty accurate description. Napoleon was like, uh-oh, what are we going to do with these black people who are over here wilding out? Um, and that's the first, I mean, I can't remember where I heard this quote, but I'm sure you've heard it before. But when you start war back in the 1800s or anywhere in the past, who are the first people that you send? It's not necessarily the uh, soldiers. You send the missionaries in because you want to control the mind. You want to control the culture. You want to dictate what is going to happen. Haiti is 90% uh, Roman Catholic, 10% Protestant, and we'll joke and say that we're 100% voodoo. Um, and that is the thing that they were scared of. When you look at voodoo as a whole, there is a quote I wanted to read for you here. We believe in very simple things. It's one, a connection to our ancestors, the ones who had passed, also known as the Lua. And when you are going through the type of trauma that slavery can endure, the one thing that is going to hold you together is going to be the people that have either passed through it or the people that have taught you something. So our connections to our ancestors can be one of the most powerful things that we can have. So what could be one of the first things that we can do to control this Haitian population is to villainize the thing that gave them the power that they had to begin with. And that's what I start to look into. So I'm gonna read this quote. Voodoo is thus not a real, uh, 
is not really a body of beliefs, but a body of practices that illustrate beliefs. It is not a religion so much as a way of life or a form of relationship, service, in addition to religious practices that one performs to one's ancestral dead, or the mo, the family spirits, the lua. While the vast majority of voodoo, voodoo saints profess Roman Catholic faith, voodoo ceremonies contain Catholic elements and imagery. So when you look into what voodoo has become over time, it's a collection of all these different cultures the West Africans coming from Benin or Senegal, uh, the original gender color that were living in Haiti, and them trying to figure out how to live in harmony to be able to exist under this rule of slavery that has taken us out. Like I had said earlier, we were the first independent black culture ever, culture, country ever, uh, and the second independent nation in the world. Uh, the Lua, which is in a way, a saint or uh, one of the gods within Haitian culture, uh, despite all of the negative things that we see on TV, the animal sacrifices or uh, the violence that might be portrayed within Haiti, uh, our, our main belief is, is being able to create an opportunity for connection to our elders, our past, um, and asking for advice and admonishment, um, goodwill, good health. And I want to figure out why we can't continue to live that. Why don't we need that when we clearly do? So as an artist right now, I'm starting to really dig into this. And what was interesting was recognizing how my body was reacting and learning about some of this stuff. It's things that have been told to me as a child, but nobody really digs into it and tells you all of these stories unless you're a voodoo priest or, or uh, a descendant of one. So I have to go out of my way and figure out where exactly I fit in within this. And also recognizing we could have accepted voodoo and that spelling and been in, out in the world. What I love about the fact that most people don't know about the other pronunciations of voodoo or voodoo is that it's still ours. It still remains ours. And if I start to see a movie title with the Mari Hardwick that's spelled V-O-D-O-U, that's when I start to get a little bit worried. Something that can still remain ours and something that can still remain powerful, but maybe it could be spread within our community. So I'm hoping that we can continue to look into our powers and, and not be afraid of those things that we were told to be afraid of. Um, those stories are in our DNA. Um, like you had said earlier, and I, I believe that this is a story that's in my DNA that I'm going to continue to explore and hopefully bring out that power not only within myself, but in my communities. So thank you for having me. I hope you all have a great time the rest of the time here. Thank you so much, both of you. There was a both both presentations, there's a lot more uh, to both their presentations. They had to cut it short because of time. However, uh, we'd like to, at this point, uh, take uh, a Q&A from the audience. Sorry. From... Oh, I'm so sorry. Forgive me, y'all. Nitsi? <laughs> I'm sorry. Um. I am here. How are you? Go right ahead. Go right ahead. Yeah, let me share my screen. Yeah. Well, first of all, thank you all to the organizers and to everybody. And I am so, so sorry that I cannot be there with you today. Uh, my nephew coughed in my face. So, and I got a cold. Uh, so, so, um, so it, it felt that it was not going to be very polite if I was there coughing and sneezing and getting my germs all over buddy. So, um, so I'm presenting and coming to you all the way from Columbus, Ohio. So I wanna thank like the organizers and as well as the tech uh, crew helping so that I could be there with you. And I'm so sorry again that I am not there. I just heard that the food was delicious. Um, so, um, but in any case, so today and adding to this amazing already two presentations that you heard today, I wanted to share a little bit about La Llorona. Uh, the Wailing Woman and her continued relevance for in Latino and Latinx communities in the United States. And 
similarly to my co-panelist, this story is close and dear to my heart. She has been uh, an amazing companion basically all my life. I grew up with her story. And, and actually as a grown up, I heard a version of my name, uh, the legend of Mincita. My name uh, means it comes actually from a name, from a legend from the conquest. Uh, so there's a version of the of the legend of La Llorona that actually is with my name. So there is a Llorona that is Mincita. Um, so so her story again is something that um, has been been very meaningful to me and that I think continues to highlight the importance of stories and how stories right we normally think about them as these like something for fun, but they're incredibly relevant right and they, and they tell our stories our survival of fight right. So La, La Llorona's screams and her tears have in many ways shaped our continent, right? Dating prior to the arrival of the Europeans, La, Royon, La Llorona's screams um, could be heard through the, street, the streets of Tenochtitlan announcing the arrival of the conquistadores and the destruction that they brought. So since then, her wails have served to scare, protect, nurture, transform, and empower Latinx communities. The legend of La Llorona actually is can be found throughout the continent in different ways, different versions. I am obviously not going to go over all of them because our time is short. But her presence has been, again, really, and it's been very, very old. So this is, for example, an image from the Florentine Codex from 1577. So it's a depiction, actually, of La Llorona as um, it's believed that prior to the arrival of the Europeans, there were seven omens announcing the destruction of the Aztec empire. And one of the omens actually is, was the goddess Iwalcoatl, who actually started roaming at night the streets of Tenochtitlan, crying and wailing and saying, all my children, all my children, what will happen to my children? So she was, and she is recorded again as one of the first versions of La Llorona. And, you know, as my co-panelists and everybody we've been talking about, right, and the amazing, beautiful introduction of the panel is the importance of expressive cultural practices. So one of my PhDs is in folklore from Indiana University. I, was, I also did anthropology and folklore, actually, and why I decided to study folklore is because we don't deal necessarily on the hardcore data that anthropologists or other disciplines need, right? We take what and we consider what the people say, not as truth necessarily, right? Because we don't, we're not interested necessarily in the truth, but to really take into consideration why the story that they're telling is important for them, right? So that empirical truth and all that stuff, it does, it's, that is not what we care is actually what we can learn from the stories that are being told in the way that they're being told, right? So we pay a lot of attention to the power and the relevance of oral narratives, be them, you know, legends, myths, folk tales, tall tales, proverbs, you know, jokes, all of those tell us a lot of information about the people, what is important, what is meaningful for them. So I think this is why the legend of La Llorona is so important and how it has survived and it continues to change for so long. So my undergrad thesis, senior thesis was actually on the legend of La Llorona and actually looking at how she changed during five, a period of 500 years of Mexican history and how the legend would actually shift based on the historical context of what was going on. So that really tells, again, of the importance of the stories, how they are alive, right, and, and how meaningful they are to people, right, and whoever is telling them. So in this very, very brief presentation, I am going to very briefly go through some of the most common motifs of the legend of La Llorona, how uh, she's been represented a little bit in terms of literature and popular culture. She has a, also a very strong presence in music, but more than anything, I want us to pay attention, right? Especially to how she has become now a symbol of resistance, right? And how and why she's still very much relevant in the 21st century for the Latinx community in the United States. So this is very briefly what I what I wanted to talk about today. 
So the legend of La Llorona, as I mentioned, right? Uh, one of the first versions is the one about Sihualcuato, right? That she was roaming and um, announcing the arrival and the destruction of Tenochtitlan, the arrival of the Spanish and the destruction of Tenochtitlan. But also from the time period of the conquest, La Llorona and the image and the, the, uh, the historical figure of La Malinche actually came intertwined. So very briefly, La Malinche was, um, an indigenous slave that was gifted to Hernán Cortés. Hernán Cortés is the principal conquistador that brought the fall of Tenochtitlán, what is now Mexico City. And then he was the one that led the spread uh, to destroying the rest of the empires and the civilizations that existed in what is now Mexico and Northern Central America. So he got all the way to Guatemala, actually. So La Malinche, this indigenous woman called Malintin, she was gifted as, as a slave to Hernán Cortés, and it turns out that she was someone that was really good with languages. She spoke multiple indigenous languages, and she was able to pick up Spanish very quickly. So she became Hernán Cortés' personal translator and lover, right? But she was not a lover, right? She's a slave. She was raped, and, and, but she was presented in the way that the imagination is that she was her lover, and because of her, so met, you know, Tenochtitlan fell. So La Malinche then, during the first years of the conquest, and especially during the independence movement in Mexico, she became the figure of the damned woman, that she was, at, because of her, that Mexico fell. So she was, and, and the way that, again, she has been portrayed historically has been horribly. So she became La Llorona in the sense that when she died, because of her crimes, she was damned and she was then damned to roam the earth crying and asking for forgiveness. Um, so then La Llorona La Malinche become one, right? The soul, this damn woman. Other versions, and this is, for example, the one that I grew up with, is this mother that has two children, has children, and that she is abandoned by her lover. And in her despair, she drowns her children in a nearby river or creek. And this is the most common version, actually, of La Llorona. So I grew up that, you know, if I did not behave correctly, La Llorona was going to kick, you know, was going to come and, you know, kidnap me. And because she was roaming, searching for her children, because she could not rest in peace until she found the souls of her, you know, her children. So a parallel version to that one is, you know, this, you know, heartbroken woman kills her children, but she's not searching for her children. She's searching for her ex-lover. So she is attacking men and killing men. So those two legends are two, those are the two most common versions actually, and that transform after the conquest, independence, and that a lot of people actually grew up with. So when I grew up, La Llorona was someone that was to be afraid of. Um, so she was someone that, again, was going to take children away. And I grew up in Mexico around the Lake of Pátzcuaro, where she was supposed to be roaming. So, so yes, fun times, right, as a kid. So, and also, so I wanted to highlight the work of Domino René Pérez. She is a brilliant, amazing scholar. She's a professor at UT Austin, University of Texas, Austin. And her book, There Was a Woman, La Llorona from Folklore to Popular Culture, does an amazing work, actually, of tracing how the legend of La Llorona has been repurposed. She doesn't do necessarily historical, um, because again, it's we're talking about hundreds of years of the versions of Legends of La Llorona. So she is specifically focuses among Mexican American writers in the US, um, so among the Latinx community, but it's specifically to think about how the motif and the image of La Llorona has, has changed through time and how people have been using her. And in popular culture, for example, how she shows up online, internet, as well as movies, but it's still, <coughs> sorry, this image very much of this damn woman, right? The woman that is haunting the waters and that is seeking vengeance either to this, this lover that, you know, broke her heart or she is damned because she killed her children, right? So, sorry, water. So the legend also of La Llorona, right, shows up in a lot of different ways and it's specifically actually in music. So as I said, right prior to arrival of the Europeans, La Llorona was already a very important figure, not just because she was a representative of Sihualcoatl uh, or she was tied to Sihualcoatl, but also she, um, as a, actually a story in terms of music, 
So the first songs actually of La Llorona are in indigenous languages. So specifically, the first recording is in Zapotec, with Zapoteco, which is one of the indigenous languages of Oaxaca. And then from there, it actually got translated to other uh, Mexican indigenous languages and obviously into Spanish, which if you saw the movie Coco, there's actually a scene of the cartoon Frida singing La Llorona or the grandmother. There's a scene where they're singing La Llorona in the movie Coco, right? So one of the versions. Because La Llorona actually as a song, it's very much traditional that there are hundreds of different versions or um, variants of the lyrics of the song. So you can basically choose the version of the song that you want to that you want to uh, sing and or perform. And, you know, here I have a, a YouTube link. We're not going to go and, and see it where these three Mexican uh, performers are different actual musical genres and they're awesome. So this is actually from the Latin Grammys a couple of years ago that they're performing one of the versions of La Llorona. Uh, of the song. So you see her also uh, moving among genres, right? So she's not just in a legend, but she is in terms of storytelling and performance as well as in music. But where I wanted to go and, you know, uh, in terms of my presentation was specifically to talk about her resistance and how actually from those early stories, right, of La Llorona, Sihualcoatl, right, crying for children, or La Malinche, or this mother that kills her children and that's seeking vengeance, something that has happened in the last 20 years is that La Llorona and the appearances of La Llorona have been used very much as resistance. So the image that you have on the, I think it would be your left, is of activist Marie Sainz that is dressed as La Llorona. And this is for a performance piece in Mexico City by this organization that is protesting the high rise of numbers of femicides in Mexico. Um, and especially to highlight again how in terms of women, uh, so, so here it's very interesting how they're using a part of their pieces at La Llorona as both as, as a figure that is protesting the killings of women, but at the same time as a vengeful mother that is going to come to avenge the killing of her children, which are the women, right, the victims of femicide. So here again, La Llorona is it's mixing both of these images um, in terms of how it's being used by these performance artists to protest femicides. The other image that you see here, it's about, it's from a movie. This is the poster of a movie by Jairo Bustamante. This is a, a Guatemalan uh, filmmaker. And this is a movie from 2019, a Guatemalan horror film that is actually set up um, um, and using actually as, uh, as um, como sería? so it's talking about, you know, the, the violence uh, and the Guatemalan Mayan genocide orchestrated by the government in the 1980s. And it's set up now in, in the present where um, these, the perpetrators that the military leaders of those massacres are being supposedly taken to justice, but nothing is happening. So it's all these protests are happening and um, to tr people trying to, get these um, these leaders actually uh, convicted of their crimes, uh, you know, against these massacres of the Mayan communities. And what starts happening is that it follows one of the, one of the dictators, which is supposed to represent Rios Mot, which was one of the main dictators during his regime, where the majority of the massacres and the genocide actually happened. So this character then starts seeing and hearing a La Llorona and things start happening in the house that actually, you know, uh, you know, brings him to justice. So here you have a retelling also of La Llorona that she's still very much this vengeful image, this vengeful mother, but that she's seeking justice for the killing of her children. In this case, the indigenous Maya women and children specifically that were killed during the, the civil war in Guatemala in the 1980s. So here again, you see this mixture in terms of how La Llorona is being seen and is being represented currently. This is also another now uh, bringing it back a little bit to the United States. So this is actually a mural by Juan Alicia. This is in San Francisco in the Mission District. It's called La Llorona Sacred Waters. She painted it in 2004. I think it's still, I mean, it's chipped and, and stuff like right now, but it's still there in the Mission District. And it's a beautiful, beautiful mural where she's presenting La Llorona and all the different versions of La Llorona. But it's specifically, as you can see, that she's trying to protect, right? It's a mural that is very much criticizing police brutality, the killings at the border, femicides, and, um, and it's very much, and also actually ecological disasters. So there's, uh, you know, 
um, that there's been sightings of La Llorona in places where there's been ecological disasters here in the United States. Um, actually, in the, the children detention center, supposedly La Llorona is going there to claim her children to take them to safety. So La Llorona is actually still very much showing up and appearing in different places now in the United States where the Latinx community are being basically attacked and are being hurt. Yes, this is uh, this is amazing. And, and because we're running out of time, I I, yeah, I, yeah, I was just done. Okay. This was my, right. that was my conclusion. Right. Yeah, 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 I was done. So I was going to say, right, that to some degree, right, it's a return to the start, right? So that now La Llorona is going back to being Sehualcoatl, right, that she's crying for the violent killing of her children, that her wails are still haunting us. But this time her cries are rallying force to fight back. So yeah, I was I was there. I was there. Perfect. <laughs> Thank you, Mitzi. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, fine. I was there. I was there. I got you. I Thank you. My apologies back. for not remembering <laughs> that you were actually on screen earlier. So thank you. So do we have time for five minutes? Okay, great. So, okay. <laughs> thank you. So we're going to uh, thank you all so much. Thank you, uh, Mitzi. We're going to uh, have room for you all to ask questions. So. If you have any questions, please come to one of the three microphones in the center of the building and introduce yourself first and then your question. Go right ahead. My name is Halima. I am a PhD student in world history at Northeastern. Um, this panel has been so inspiring to me. Thank you, um, all three of you, for sharing really incredible narratives with us today. Um, I have a couple questions. I'm going to try to summarize them. But um, my first question really is um, how can, or rather, if we could expand on how white capitalism opposes spiritual practices, like how are they oppositional to each other exactly? Um, and we talked a little bit about the importance of expressive cultural narratives, but I would like us to talk about how these expressive cultural narratives um, become materially liberatory. So by like materially, I mean practically liberatory. Um, I'm, I'm trying to like find a word that is not necessarily to do with finance, but I'm just interested in whatever connection spiritual practices have around um, liber liberatory practices like with quality of life, for example, right? Like how does spirituality, how does culture come in contact with quality of life? Um, yeah. So I, I think another one place that I found um, a connection was, Mitzi, when you talked about the artist who was protesting the high rises that were being constructed by using that Lara, uh, La La Runa, I hope I said that right, <laughs> uh, motif. I'm interested in other places in which these two kind of intersect, especially around like voodoo or Ifa and Kisi, things that you meant, you've all mentioned. Thank you very much. Thank you for that question, wow. Um, this is probably way too simplistic, but you know, you mentioned, I'm probably throwing this word in there, um, white patriarchal capitalism <laughs> versus um, spirituality. And I think at its core, African spirituality is, is rooted in reciprocity and there is nothing more anti-capitalist than sharing, sharing wealth, being reciprocal, um, so it, they're almost counter, they're, they're very counterintuitive to each other. Um, and I will just quickly address the, the second question. I mean, I think within, and I'll just speak for myself, within practice of African spirituality, it is about honoring and taking care of your body. And I was recently told uh, by a friend that at some point, you have to stop looking to your ancestors to answer everything for you and fix everything for you. And your purpose is to become a good ancestor, right? So there's a shift in thinking. And in order for that to happen, you have to be healthy, mind, body, and soul. And so it goes beyond the sort of, um, I can't think of the word, but I think of it all the time with, with our concept of health. It's, you have to be functional. Right, and, and the goal is to be functional with your health and not necessarily look for the causes of ill health or maladies 
or focus on staying healthy, right? It's fixing problems when they arise. And so I think African spirituality and a lot of indigenous spiritualities are about keeping your mind, body, and soul in balance. And part of that is being reciprocal. Part of that is honoring your ancestors. Part of that is honoring your body as a part of creation. Yeah, I definitely want to echo a lot of that. Um, within, within Haitian culture, you can look back and see the connections between how specifically the US had tried to control Haitian culture um, and voodoo. Um, and uh, one of which was leading embargoes against, uh, against Haiti so that no country in the world was trading with Haiti. Um, and Haiti being a country known for its rich resources and sugar, uh, we were literally robbed of that in our rebellion um, and fighting back and burning, back all, burning all of those uh, sugar fields. And a, a later point in Haitian culture as well, uh, something had happened with the pigs that were happening all around Haiti. Um, and those had gotten infected with some kind of disease, so the U.S. had suggested that they kill all of the pigs, um, and every single pig was killed in Haiti. Now that also affects the uh, traditions within Voodoo um, and being able to sacrifice animals. So uh, within that, they brought in a whole bunch of swine into uh, uh, into Haiti and also all those swines needed super expensive antibiotics so that started to uh, drain our funds in that way. Um, and then I always had said this phrase but uh, it doesn't really start to resonate until you start to see it in practice and it's that uh, our existence is, is the resistance. Um, and, all, and throughout all of that it was an attempt to wipe out what was striving and uh, completely independent from capitalism and white patriarchal capitalism. So to be able to exist today in the same way that you were just saying um, is the resistance and is the fight moving forward. Thank you. Mitzi, did you want to respond? Oh, shoot. Mitzi, it's Pierre. Did you want to respond? Um, sure. Um, I'll be brief. So I think especially for the Latinx community and especially for um, the Latina community in the United States, La Llorona has become a really important figure for liberation, for survival. And also in terms, of, I think what you were talking about also in terms of healing. Um, so that there's, you know, with the, the waves of third world feminism from the 1980s, Gloria Sandúa, Chiri Moraga, Norma Cantú, Norma Larcón, so many of them, they are the ones that start reframing La Llorona to make it relevant for Latinas in the United States, Latinas and members also of the, the queer Latinx uh, community. And uh, so that it's not this vengeful like mother, but it's a mother that is taking care of us and is also fighting for us, right? In terms of environmental collapse, capitalist collapse, right? That she is showing up in the maquilas and the maquiladoras and the border to defend, right? All the women that are being disappeared, right? And Ciudad Juarez and the border. Um, so that, that, you know, they, as a figure, right, it's very much um, a form of empowerment, but protection and in terms of also healing. A lot of the, the hurts and uh, the historical hurts coming from conquest and colonization. Um, but I also wanted to add something that um, to the words and, and some of the concepts that is also, I think, very key in terms of healing is also community. Right? We don't just do healing, as much as healing is, is an individual process, but at the same time, it's very much communal process. Um, and how we have to also heal as a community. And I think that, that is part of the work that a lot of people are doing with La Llorona and, and the power of La Llorona coming together and how and why she's still so relevant um, till, to, you know, till this day. Thank you, thank you, panel. Okay, so <laughs> I wanna just close um, by saying, number one, thank you to each of you. And I hope that you feel better, Mitzi. I hope that you are beginning to heal. Okay, good. Uh, to each of you for bringing uh, some new perspectives, um, some new information uh, to each of us. And I am certainly interested in learning more about how you all actually begin your research when very little is known and there is no sort of empirical sort of uh, scholarly works out there, I am fascinated by your ability to uncover and to create new knowledge from a speck of dust. And so uh, if we speak again, and we will, 
I'd love to learn more about your research methods. But until, until then, I want everyone to give everyone, uh, these folks a round of applause. Good? Okay, you're welcome.